Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our 2023 workshop series. Um, you should have gotten an alert on your screen right now that we are recording this so that you can share it with your staff and your board members after the presentation and research it as needed. Um, on today, we have Tom Bleach from the Community Foundation. He's going to be kind of taking in uh, Margarita's role that you're familiar with. So if you have comments and questions um, after the presentation, please feel free to reach out to Tom. And Tom and I will be monitoring the chat today. If you're new to our series, um, please feel free to just hit the raise hand button during Mike's presentation and Tom and I will grab his attention so we can get your questions addressed. Um, we will have a survey at the end of this presentation that'll be coming to you through email. Please fill that out. That's how we gauge our success with these trainings. And we wanna make sure that we're, we're really hitting the nail on the head on what you guys need in your, in your organization. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike so he can get started on his presentation. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks to everyone for participating here. I do see a couple of familiar faces and names. Um, so let me let me tell you what you signed on for, what you've gotten yourselves into here. Um, what 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 I want to do is talk not about um, how to do a strategic plan. Um, just as a little bit of background for me, I, I I work exclusively with nonprofits, and most of what I do has has something to do with strategy. And what what I have found in my own experience, um, even before I started doing this as a consultant, was strategic planning rarely works the way it's supposed to work. And and my own belief is that is that people spend too much time, you know. You I'm sorry, oh, too much time planning um, and not enough time sort of thinking. So uh, Mike, you went on mute on mine. How long ago? What's the last thing you heard? About 10 seconds or so, I guess. Ah, you missed my best joke. That's when I lay that in there. All right. So let me share my screen. Can you see that? You're not seeing. Well, let's try it again. How about that? There we go. And my yeah. video does weird things. I'm going to turn myself off. Only because it does weird things. There we go. Imagine, just pretend you see my mouth moving when I, as you look at this. So now can you see the presentation? Yes, okay. we can. All just right. a reminder so, to participants to please turn on your cameras if you're able to. All right, let me let me try my. So what what I want to talk about here, as I said, is more more about strategic thinking. And and I see a lot of strategic plans. And um, one of the things that I like to do is to is to look at a strategic plan and and look at all the things that are listed there. And and I ask myself, and sometimes I'll ask the nonprofit. If you if you do all these things, what is going to be different? What's going to be better? Um, and, and a lot of times there's not a really clear answer to that. And, and for me, that means that we're really good at, at figuring out what we need to do. And so my, my emphasis has always been on the front end. Let's figure out why. So the, an example I like to use is my, my good buddy, we travel together, our families. And when he plans a trip, it's what time we leave, where we're going to stop for lunch, what time we plan to get into the hotel, what time we check in, all of that stuff. When I plan a vacation, I start with what am I trying to accomplish with this vacation, right? Am, am I trying to 
take in some sights? Do I want to learn about some history? Do I want to relax? And, and then once I have an understanding of why I'm going in the first place, then I think about, okay, then, then how, what do I have to do to make sure that this vacation helps me relax? And so I set parameters like um, we're not going to go to big tourist sites, right? Um, we're not going to eat at chain restaurants because we can do that here. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to um, get up every morning and, and go somewhere. So I kind of set some parameters. So when we get back from that trip and someone asks my friend, hey, how did it go? And he says, oh, great. We got there on time. The hotel was great. We checked in. We were right on schedule. The question I want to ask, someone ask me is, did you get a chance to relax, right? So all of those logistic things are important, and that's what we're really good at. So the, the focus I want to bring is let's let's take a step back and figure out what, what where we're going, why we're going there, and why we think that's the best place for us to go. Uh, what are some of those broad parameters that will guide us as we move toward that? So with, with that in mind, understanding that I know, you know, without my friend, I may never get to where we're going, um, but I focus on let's let's think about those other parts. And there I go jumping again. My video is weird. So if you start to chuckle, I, I understand. All right. Did the slide advance? I, I can only see you. All right. I'm sorry, dear Jesus. Believe me, I, I this irritates me as much as you. Hey, Mike, the slide is not advancing, and all we're seeing is your um, the, full deck. Yeah, the full deck. We're not seeing just the slide. How about now? Uh, no, we're still seeing the the full deck. Okay. Let me try something here. Can you see it now? No, um, just seeing the full deck. So I'm not sure if you just want to go. No, I, the... Yeah, I'm just going to go through. I'm sorry. I don't, I do this a hundred times and half the times it works. Okay. So let me start with this idea of this this quote and, and that is it's when we talk about strategy is is this is from michael porter that we're really talking about what we're not going to do um i i've never met a nonprofit um that ran out of ideas or couldn't think of what to do next typically the challenge is there's more that we could do there's more that we want to do. There's more that our clients need us to do. But it's hard to do everything. So, so the real work is finding that focus and deciding what, what we're not going to do. So and again, I want you to keep this idea in mind because it kind of speaks to, as I said before, um, my vacation to get what I want out of it is as much about what we're not going to do as it is the things that we want to accomplish. So we, we will come back to that idea. Okay, did that advance? Yes, it did. So you see my little balloon guy there? Yes. Okay, so th this is for me, um, what nonprofit the nonprofit experience is, and you've seen this this balloon person um, in front of car dealerships, whatever, right? And and if you notice it, it sort of it kind of goes with the wind. And when you think about that, it's kind of the world of a nonprofit because you, we spend a lot of time reacting because. You know, we can't control the wind, right? We can't control how hard it's going to blow. We don't know what direction it's going to come from. But when it does, we we have 
we have to respond, we have to react. But for me, the, the most significant part of this image of the balloon person is that little dark piece on the bottom. Because even though this balloon person sways with the wind, it never leaves its spot. And so if you think about, when we talk about thinking strategically, we're focusing on what are those pieces that keep us grounded? So no one saw COVID coming um, and it hit us you know, in some pretty hard ways. Um, and it really challenged us to think about how, how secure are we bolted into the ground on what we consider to be our, our fundamentals. And so we, we can't, we're never going to control the wind. We're never going to change its direction on our own. But what we can do is to be really clear about despite all of these things that come at us, and some of them are good, right? Some of them are opportunities. Um, you know, a grand opportunity comes along and you say, wow, this, this could really be good for us. Should we do it? And so hopefully the answer to that question, we go back to these fundamentals or what, what are we grounded in and how do we use that to make a decision about whether or not um, it makes sense for us to do it. So one of the things I wanna differentiate here is the difference between um, mission and strategy. And a lot of times I will hear people say, well, you know, we, we should do this because it fits our mission. Um, are, you, are you seeing that slide of the swimming pool? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah. I, I, this is, I, I know this is irritating. I can't see what you're seeing, so I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> um, so, so this idea of, of mission, again, what, what, to say it fits the mission, therefore we should do it, um, it is, is not strategic enough. What, what needs to happen is we need to think about this. So us being in that swimming pool, um, let's say we're, we're in the youth development area. Well, we're not the only one in that pool. What, what helps us make strategic decisions is when we define the lane that we're in. So your, your mission kind of puts you in that swimming pool. But again, there are a lot of other people swimming around. Your strategy is saying, how do we think we can play our role in youth development? So it really is a matter of finding, finding that lane that we're gonna be in. And even with that, you can start to say, well, that means then there are some things that are outside of our lane. Yes, that goes back to the idea of deciding what we're not gonna do. Um, it also says there are other people in other lanes swimming. So part of strategy is to understand where do we fit in relative to these other people in the same swimming pool? Are we doing the same thing they're doing? Or are we doing things that they're not doing? So the question about where we fit in relative to our mission is when we really start to move to, the, to that more strategic thinking. So rather than saying, this fits our mission, should we do it? The, the follow-up question is, this fits our mission, does it support the strategy we have chosen to fit that mission? So what, what is this all about? Really, really all of this talk about being in the swimming pool and finding our lane, we're, we're all trying to do something good um, for a community or for a population. And, and strategy, in, in the biggest picture sense, is really about these three things. Are we relevant? And, and that means, well, are the needs of our clientele changing? Are the priorities of the community changing? Um, I've worked with a couple, uh, well, several merger discussions. And in a couple of them, what prompted it was the organization had become irrelevant. And, and yeah, they were able to attract enough funding to sort of, you know, to, to keep breathing, um, but, but the world had passed them by and, and they, they were just doing what they did and they just kept doing it. Um, but what really happened is, is, you know, again, priority shifted, needs changed. So we want to, number one, it's all about staying relevant. 
The second is making a difference. Um, you know, we, making a difference that matters to people other than us. Um, so this, this goes to the question of, you know, we, we really love the programs that we do um, and, and the, the families really enjoy coming here. That's good. But the question is, so what? You know, are, are we just providing a good time or are we helping move individuals or families along the continuum, whatever that continuum is for your work? So it, it's, it's one thing to be liked, and that's important. It's another to say we're, we're making a difference. And then the third part is how do we support our work? Um, this is this, you know, the, the issue of, of funding. Um, and, and as you, as you kind of get into this strategic thinking, hopefully your board, I will focus on the board on this part, moves away from, let's just go write more grants and let's just have another fundraiser. That may be the right thing to do, but the right question is, where are we likely to get the funding that we need to sustain ourselves? And in a mad dash for cash, usually isn't it. So when we really step back, all this talk about strategy and priorities and all of that is really aimed at these three things. Are, are, we, are we still relevant? Do we matter? Are we making a difference? And can we keep this up? So this one, I, I came across this a couple of months ago. And, and if you think about traditional strategic planning, where we have a lot of goals, a lot of objectives, a lot of measurables, all of that stuff, and, and look at that in light of this. And if you can't summarize your strategy in 30 words or less, it probably isn't a strategy. What it probably is, is a to-do list for your organization. These are all the important things. To have a strategy summary is not about the things you need to do. It's where are, how do you fit in, right? So to be able to explain to a, a let's say a potential donor, um, wh where's your lane in this pool? Because as an example there, I was asked one time to interview um, providers of um, um, adult literacy. And there are probably six of them at that time in, in Fort Wayne. And, and I was asked to go in and, and kind of figure out why all these are necessary and is there unnecessary duplication? And the fact is they all had a very specific lane. Now there was a little bit of splash over, um, but each of them could say to me, you know, I know from the outside, it looks like the same, here's what we're doing for this population. And the other group said, well, our funding tells us we can only work with this population on these issues for this long. So, so even though it looked like everyone was just splashing around in the pool, they had their lane and they were able to describe that. So that's part of what we're talking about. And the second part is, I think, especially for, for donors, is where are you going? Right, so you're you're in this lane. Is is that the right lane for you? Do you have aspirations to to broaden your lane? Um, are you just going to keep swimming the same stroke back and forth forever? So when we talk about summarizing your strategy, that's what we're talking about. Where, where do you fit in? Why is that the right lane for you? And do you see yourself kind of moving somewhere else beyond that? So here, here's what that lane is. It, again, and you'll start to see some overlap with these, but I'm, what I really want to come out of this is kind of a, a mindset for thinking about the, these strategic pieces. One is, is the, the programmatic. What do you do for whom and to what end? Right now, it's I don't mean name every little activity or program. I'm talking about stepping back, who is your target population, right? Who, who are you there for? Um, what is it about them? What's their circumstance? And what are you trying to make happen? So you may say, 
um, and I'm gonna, the person knows I'm talking about this organization. We provide um, shelter for women who are struggling with issues related to addiction and homelessness. Oh, okay, that's really clear. What do you do for them? Well, we provide this. While they're here, we do these three things so that when they leave us, they are able to blank. That's a, that's a, a lane description of your program. The second part, again, is, the, is this, how, how, how do you fit in? Who else is doing similar work? So to say to yourself as an organization, we understand that there's not services. So a, a place I'm working with in Fort Wayne, um, it happens to be another shelter. Um, they realize that there is not a shelter for single women, believe it or not, right? So, so they said, well, what we're doing, and people say, well, isn't, isn't the rescue mission doing that? Isn't Karis House doing that? Um, they have to be able to say, well, we understand what they do. Here's why we're doing what we do. So again, that's part of that big picture. We're doing this. Here's where we fit in. And here's how we support our work. So for example, you may say we, um, we think the most sustainable funding mix for us is to um, continue to work with government grants um, or contracts and supplement that with some donors. Or there are a couple of examples I know of where um, in one case, 90% of their funding is government funding, which says, well, then we don't have to do a whole lot of fundraising. Whereas another organization that I know of is literally 100% charitable giving. So they need to do a lot. And what we're saying is we think in the long run, that's the most sustainable place for us is to rely on this charitable giving. Um, we have a history of doing that. So again, that this is all part of that 30 words or less. What are you doing? Why? Where do you fit in? And how do you make all this work? Do we have any, any questions out there from my moderators? Anybody having something? Nothing in the chat just yet, Mike. Okay. All right. I will keep rolling then. <laughs> so then how, how do you figure out what that lane is? We already know there's a need for youth development. There's a need for homeless shelters. There's a need for all of this stuff that we do. How do we figure out within that where we are going to be? And I think there, there are three questions there. One is what do you aspire to be? Another way to say that is what does your mission compel you? to do. Again, we're, we're not, we're still talking big picture, but, but this idea of, we think that we could do this. The second part of this is what does your community need you to be? So if, if you have a, a, a founder of a nonprofit whose own experience says to them, we need to do this so that no one has to go through what I went through. That's a good starting point. But if the community isn't saying we need this, and that's the difference between need and demand. You may say, I think every youth should have A, B, and C. If the community's not saying we have to find a way to provide our youth with A, B, and C. So that's, that's that piece where it's just not all about you and your organizational aspirations. It's understanding we're jumping into a swimming pool. And another way to say, what does our community need us to be is what lanes are available, right? There may be an empty lane that no one's filling. Then the third part is what are you able to be? And that has to do not just with money. Um, I'm working with several disabilities organizations. And if you're on this call, you understand this. Their biggest constraint is, is finding uh, direct service providers. They have great history, great programs, but at least now they're not able to be everything they would like to be because they can't find that steady supply of, of frontline staff. So this is where strategy becomes difficult. 
And that is these three things have to fit together. And, and it, it's a, it turns into then not wouldn't it be great if, but given the way it is, we have to trade off this to do this. So we may not be able to support our full aspiration because of resource limitations. Then what can we be? It doesn't mean you then you just say, well, forget it. You, you trade off and you find that place where you can do the most of what you can do that's needed. And, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but, but a lot of times people think that it's always about growth. Sometimes in, better impact comes from depth. You actually do less, right? Maybe even for a smaller group of people, but you go into much greater depth. How do we then, again, inform those decisions? I, you know, one thing is a, a couple of things strategy isn't. Strategy is not always transformational. Right, we we have to reinvent ourselves. That that does happen, but mostly it's about if you imagine this this journey. First, look at how did we get here, right? It it, it you just didn't drop out of a helicopter and start doing what you're doing. You have your organization has a history, and what we're looking for are the major decisions, um, maybe those pivot points maybe some milestones, um, because again, that, that explains where we are and how we got here. To under, with that, then we can say, well, what has that taught us? And, and some typical lessons are things like, well, and again, I'm just gonna use this somewhat generically, we serve women. We said, well, the next logical step is for us to serve men, and that didn't work. So what we learned was stay in our lane as we had to find it. Um, another lesson that is, is common is um, we tend to overextend. Um, and it's not that we're, we're sort of you know, going outside the lane, we're, we're expecting to swim faster than we're able to swim. Um, or we've learned that um, we're at our best when we're fully engaged with the community. So all of those lessons that we can say, okay, this is going to help us then moving forward because we know part of how you got here is you, and I, and I, I use the word mistake, but not in a judgmental kind of way. You made some decisions that if you could do it again, you might not do it again, right? So that's what we're talking about. Let, let's gather up the best of what we've learned about ourselves, what we've learned about the people we serve what we've learned about our community. You may learn that this community doesn't like startups, that they're, they're more conservative when it comes to funding. So when we launch a new program, we have to expect that it's gonna take a, maybe a little bit of time for us to get the community you know, sort of, sort of sold on the idea. And only then can we say, okay, we know how we got here. We know what we've learned. Now, where do we go? And that's when we start sort of getting into this positioning language. It may be that we like where we are for all of these reasons, but as we know, nothing stands still. So how do we ensure that we're able to keep doing what we're doing? So let's go back to the staffing issue. One of the, where do we go next? Maybe, you know, if you're in, let's say the disabilities community, you, you're doing all the right things for the right people for the right reasons. You know your lane. Um, where you go next is to say, for us to maintain this, we have to find a way to, to retain and recruit staff, which means maybe we need some incentive programs, maybe we need some partnerships with some universities. It's all about what's it take to either keep us where we think we need to be, or to say, you know what, the world's starting to change, we run the risk of becoming irrelevant, we need to incrementally, not transformationally, but incrementally start to rethink not so much what we do, but maybe how we do it, where we do it, those kind of things. So that's when you start to get to what I call the more actionable strategic priorities. 
Um, and you can see where a list uh, that falls out of this process, um, it's gonna be easier to follow the breadcrumbs back and say, okay, here, here's the strategic context. So on one hand, you'd say, well, who, who wouldn't want a staff recruitment and retention program? Fair enough. But what we're saying is, if we don't get this, we run the risk of slipping back from our established strategic position now. So, so again, it's sort of this looking backward, looking inward sets the context for those other questions about how do we then, what's our lane look like moving forward? Um, my editorial comment, this is where then you go back and you get the data you need to answer these questions. I, I think it's a mistake to do a big data dump on the front end and ask, well, what do the data tell us about this? Data don't tell you anything. <laughs> data, they answer questions. So only when you're clear on the questions that you have to have answers to, to, to talk about where you go next, then you go get that data to inform that part of your discussion. How are we doing? I can't see faces here. We, we're good? Still doing good. No comments right. in the chat box. All right. Is my video flickering again? Nope. You're looking great, Mike. Oh, oh thank you very much. <laughs> I did put on my best shirt this morning. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So here, here's where we're going to really get down to the nitty gritty. So what I described up to this point um, is sort of the, the, the broad sort of a, 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 a conceptual model and a vocabulary for how we think about what it means to think strategically. My, my approach to this is the same that I will, I do in my life, and I'm sure a lot of others do, probably most of you do, is um, I, we, we all have a desire in our own personal way to make the world a better place. Um, the temptation is to say, well, what are the needs out there? And let me go try and, and help or fix those. My philosophy is before you go out and do anything, you go in and you say, okay, well, let's look at me first. What, what do I care about? What are my skills? What are my passions? What are my talents? What are my philosophies? And then find a place that can use that. So the same idea with an organization is before we start looking out and saying, oh, let's become this, this, and this, let's start with an inward look first. So the, the questions, I call this the organizational core. And, and it's, it's with, if that, without this, I don't see how anyone could ever be strategic, whether they're thinking or planning. Um, because this this is uh, distills everything down to its essence. And the questions are these, as you can see, who needs you most? And, and I put that most in there because it's easy to say, well, we're for all families or we're for all youth. Uh, to give you an example, I worked with a counseling center and I asked that question. They said, well, really anybody facing any kind of behavior or developmental or psychological challenges. Okay, who's actually coming to you? And their answer was, well, 80% of our clients are court referred. That's who needs you most. Again, I didn't say exclusively, but we have to be really honest with ourselves about this question. And another way to say that is who, who benefits most from what you do? So once we have a realistic sense of that, and, and, and so when I do this work, I, I keep pushing to get them as close to the nub as I can, because if this is in any way soft or squishy now, when we get down the road, it's gonna, it's gonna amplify that ambiguity. So we have to be really crystal clear on this. The second one is, what do they need most from you? So what that says is we may be really clear on, on who benefits most from us. We can't do everything they need, right? Let's go back to this. We're, we know that there are other people in the pool. We can't do it all. So we have to be really clear about what our 
contributions are. So we, we look at things like if, if we want to end homelessness, um, that's great. You can't do that on your own. Your question is, okay, then when we get people who are homeless, what's how can we contribute to that longer term aspiration of ending homelessness? So this, this again, forces you to look inward. What do we know about ourselves? What's worked for us in the past? What hasn't worked? To really get a sense on, on I call this sort of the humility part of this, is we can't do it all. What, what can we do either better than anybody else or do that no, something nobody else is doing, but it's really forces us to narrow that down. The third one is, okay, how are they better off because of you? Another way to ask this is, how do you define success or what's your desired impact? So here again, if, if you're saying we want to end homelessness and our contribution of, uh, is this, the question is, well, what's the benefit of that contribution? Because you're not going to say we're going to do our part and suddenly they're not homeless. So a common one is to say our goal is that when they come to us and we do what we do, when they leave us, they're now prepared to take the next step on that continuum toward eradicating homelessness. So it, it's, it's again, keeps us really focused in on the essentials. Um, if we say that people are gonna come with us and they're gonna stay three months and suddenly they're gonna be employed, own a home and not be homeless, I, I, I think our aspirations are outpacing the reality. But to say, when they leave here, they're in a better position to buy a home and get a job, that, then that's what we're talking about. And this, this fourth one may or may not be relevant, but I, I like to put it in there anyway. Um, what makes you who you are? And that could be anything from a Montessori school that says the Montessori approach, the method is what makes us different. You could be faith-based and say it's the Christian principles in how we do this. It doesn't have to be what makes you distinctive. It's what, what makes you who you are. There may be others like that, but we need to understand that the fact that, or, or we, we do biblically-based counseling, or um, what's another? Oh, the, the, when I worked with a disabilities organization, one of their philosophies is client, um, client first. Well, th that's what we're talking about is if there's some kind of special sauce that, that you have, then that's what we want to identify here. Let me just pause for a second. If, if there's any questions here, th this is the, the start of all of the thinking moving forward is to be really, really clear about what that core is. Here are some examples. When you say who needs you most, the difference in saying youth versus youth with behavioral issues, that's much more specific. What do they need most from you? You could say, well, we support youth or we provide intensive therapy to youth with behavioral issues. Um, how are they better off? Improve behavior. So we support youth um, so that they can have you know, more, uh, more productive, positive behaviors versus we take in youth with behavioral issues, we provide intensive therapy. Our goal is that when they leave here, they go to a less restrictive environment. Um, defining characteristics, generically, we have a caring staff. I'm not downplaying that. Everybody has that. Um, things like in this case, we use the research based methodology. So you can see if you're trying to build off of a core and look forward, the difference in saying we support youth um, and we help them learn better behaviors and we have a really caring staff versus youth with behavioral disorder, behavioral issues, get intensive therapy, and, and our goal is to move them to a less restrictive environment and our methodology is, is, is sort of cutting edge research a very different, we can work with that second one. With that first one, we really haven't decided anything about what we're not gonna do yet. And here's where this gets fun, and I say fun in a kind of a sinister way. 
this is why we have to be crystal clear on those four elements of your core. Because then what I ask people to do, by the way, you have a worksheet there that asks you these same questions. So if, as you're thinking through this, kind of jot down some of those responses to those, those organizational core questions. If you're ever looking for a good board or staff retreat exercise, just have them do that. Have them really think about those pieces. And then if you really want to have sinister fun, have them map your current programs or activities. The language here, I use core, secondary, marginal. I've used different ways. I, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't just become a, a grammar exercise. The point is list the programs that meet all four aspects of your organizational core head on. And that's, that's your core program. You may have some programs that deviate maybe one in one area from that core. So maybe your core is youth with um, behavioral disorders or challenges, but you also have a program for adults. Okay, everything else is the same, um, or your goal for the adults is not a less restrictive environment. In other words, you're, you're picking up most of the core, but you're kind of moving away one space. Put that in that secondary category. Does that mean it's less important? It depends, right? It depends on why you're doing it. But let me, let me continue on here. If you have programs that are really kind of barely hanging on to the elements of the core, you map those, I call them marginal. So here, here's why this is important. First of all, it forces you to differentiate among your programs. I love all my, you know, my, my, I had six siblings. My parents loved all of us, but they didn't all treat us all the same way, right? There, there's a need for differentiation. This forces you to differentiate your programs based on that core essence of who you are as an organization. This matters because, for example, when you have a resource decision to make, let's say you have to cut a program or you get a grant to start a new program. The first thing I would do is to say, where would this fall on this map? If it's a core program and there's a grant to support it, there's little holding me back. If it's secondary, I would say, okay, what are the trade-offs? Um, you know, is it, does it give us an opportunity to maybe test out something different in a finite amount of time. The marginal, it better be making you a lot of money. <laughs> and typically that's where some of these social venture programs come in. It's We're, we're doing it, yes, yeah, it's, it's got a flavor of us in it, but it's it's not really what you would say is, is kind of our, our lane, but we're doing it because it generates revenue that will help us support core programs. So I did a workshop once on, on making strategic decisions. And I said, so how, how would you make decisions about programs? And one of the, uh, let's say a, a more traditional board member said, well, I would line them all up and the ones that are losing the most money are the first to go. And of course, you're, I know it's nonprofits where I'm going, well, that's <laughs> welcome to Kansas, right? I said, well, what if, what if what's most expensive is most important? that is most central to your core. So that's what we're talking about. And again, that's where strategy gets a little more difficult. You're forced to make some choices. So let's follow back. If you have a mushy sense of your organizational core, your map is gonna be kind of everything kind of fitting in where you want it to. How would you make a decision about that? So this core identification, this core mapping is the first step at least understanding where we are. So you can then say, well, it looks like um, this marginal program we thought was gonna make a lot of money, it's not. So maybe we should look at getting out of it. I don't care if you've fallen in love with it, right? I don't care how much the community loves it. It's not who you are. And you did it for a very specific reason. And that's the part, especially when you get into secondary and marginal, 
be crystal clear on why you're doing it, because that's then how you will evaluate it. Okay, so we're, we're going to shift gears. I want that's that's a lot. Um, any anything in the chat? Nothing just yet, Mike. All right, I must be nailing it, huh? <laughs> okay, let me take a breath. So that that's generally a kind of a mindset to understand thinking strategically, and and. My belief is if we get that part right, the other part about implementation and, and priorities and what do we start doing, it's gonna flow much more easily as opposed to, as I said in the introduction, you know, looking at everything that's on your list and trying to work your way back up and say, what, what, is, this, what is this about? Um, so again, it, it's, it's the heavy lifting, but I think it's also the most important part. Okay, so now I'm gonna add some, some nuance to this. Um, by the way, did you, people I'm hoping are, are filling out that, that organizational um, core chart. If you have any questions at the end of that for your own, we can certainly entertain those. One of the things that, you, you know, you probably are familiar with the nonprofit life cycles and capacity building where, where you know, you move organizations, move, um, from, you know, as it says here, from an idea to terminal. Um, this has been around for a long time, and it's one of the few things I think that has really held up well over time. It's helpful because it shows kind of the, the natural trajectory of a nonprofit organization. And as you can see, it, it's sort of, you're, you're kind of working uphill, and then you kind of find your place. Um, but what's, what this suggests is even when you found your place, it's got curved edges. There's, there is no central point that you can rest on. So this idea about our strategic position is to keep what we have, that's working between that vitality and regeneration. So even if you've gotten there, there's no guarantee you're gonna be able to stay there. So it, it's been really well researched and, and utilized. But I came along later and said, but you know what? There's also differences in the strategic questions that come up at each of these life cycles. So just to quickly run through, I have an idea that this place um, needs uh, somewhere to go for youth in the summer so they don't lose what they learned in the school year. Great. My startup, I, I gather people together. I start doing some activities. I may launch some programs. I then get to where I'm sort of finding out um, the, the scope of the need. I'm figuring out how to deliver the program. And then I reach that point to where I'm settled. So I, I took that same idea and said, well, okay. But, but again, as I said, the strategy questions are going to be different based on that. So. Let, let me, this little chart here, let me walk you through it. Then I, I'm, then I'm going to break it down and spend some time talking about that. The issue is, how do you know where you are in your life cycle? Because it's not just a matter of calendar time. With this capacity piece, with, you know, your, your management, your internal processes and systems, there are certain indicators that, you know, as you, when you're in startup, you, you don't need necessarily a, um, a sophisticated balance sheet. You probably need a, a budget and some, some tracking of costs and expenses and all that. If you're a mature organization, you probably have a chief financial officer. You probably have very sophisticated financials. So, so what I did here is to say that there are certain milestones that you know when we accomplish this, until we accomplish this, we're still in startup. And so when we reach those milestones, then we go to the growth phase. But what happens a lot of times is instead of directly hitting those milestones, 
we bump into these, I, I call them disruptors. Not everything worked like we thought it would, like we hoped it would. So we have to refine, we refine our program model, maybe we refine our fundraising. We do those changes until we eventually meet that milestone. What I'm gonna talk about later are, is what those milestones are, but for now, I just want you to get your head around kind of the, the movement through this. So then we're in growth, which is again, we sort of established a program. Same idea, there are certain milestones that tells us, okay, we are now through the growth phase. Then we move down. However, as I said before, there are gonna be specific disruptors that again, you didn't expect. We have to adapt what we're doing. And then when we hit those milestones, then we're to this place called maturity. Again, there are certain milestones with maturity, but as I said before, just because you're there, there are still gonna be disruptors. There are gonna be things that change in the environment. So for you to stay where you want to be, um, you're gonna have to, again, do some of that, that work of, of going back to you know, what we're all about, what's our core, um, and what we're doing at this phase is really affirming who we are and and which could mean we may have to change some things, cut some things, but but we're not we're not going back into startup. We're sort of affirming where we are. So on the one hand, you see you move from startup to growth to affirmation or to uh, to maturity. Um, we're refining, we're adapting, and then we're affirming. So what I want to do now is just kind of get inside of this and say, well, what what are those milestones um, for 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 example, startup? And and this is what would shape the specific questions you ask. We're always talking about how do we create the greatest mission impact in the most sustainable way. We're always talking about our program. What are we doing for whom and why? We're always focused on establishing ourselves in that lane, and we're always interested in this idea of sustainability. This just says, what does that look like in these different phases? In other words, what are the specific questions related to each of those? So I, I want to spend the rest of the time with this section on this, um, this little chart here. And don't read it across necessarily, but let's let's kind of work through this. A startup, that's that is the aspiration phase. You have a theory, you have a hunch, you have an idea that this is needed and this is a way we can address that need. You stay in startup until you have that milestone, which is full implementation of your program model you very well may get it exactly right, right out of the gate. If so, congratulations. My guess is though, in that process, you hit some kind of obstacle or barrier. You may not, as it says under these disruptors, maybe you, you weren't able to get all of the funding that you need for startup. Maybe you weren't able to attract the clients, um, maybe this is much more difficult to deliver well than you thought. All of those are what have to be reconciled or rectified before you can get to full implementation. So your first strategic plan as a startup would be to be very clear on what you think is going to happen. Very clear on where you think you're going to get your money. and then. Life happens, and, and our strategy is then to say, well, we're finding out that we can't get funding. How do we address that? Your, your planning is about what kinds of refinements do we have to make to get us to that point of full implementation. Full implementation is, again, you're, you're able to deliver the service high quality. You can afford it. You can sustain it. That's what the startup phase is. Make sense? I'm gonna, again, I can't see you, but I assume if anyone's going like this, you would raise a hand. So another thing to keep in mind is it's not, these are not rigidly discrete. So it's not like you wake up one day and say, oh good, now we're in growth. 
you're always moving, right? So you're always kind of moving from startup to growth to maturity. The movement toward growth, again, let's assume you now have full implementation of your program model. Now this phase is about adapting. So if you look at the milestone, full implementation of your program model doesn't assume it's sustainable, right? So you, you may have gotten some startup cash and a lot of volunteer work and you got it. Everything is running, but you can't get that startup funding forever and you may not always have the chance to get volunteers to do a lot of the work. So now we're saying, let's take this the, the essence of this model and how do we make it more sustainable? So some of the disruptors that you, you're likely to encounter, one is your demand exceeds your capacity. Wow, we had no idea this many people need this. And we, we, we can't do it all with our current structure. Um, you may have opportunities to grow. You never considered that so-and-so may want to partner with you to expand the program. Um, client needs start to change. So all of these things, and, and there are going to be more, but all of these things are saying, okay, now, now that we understand what full implementation looks like, we can't meet the needs of everybody out there. We can't do what everybody wants us to do. So we're now we're talking about our focus and our planning is identifying limitations, boundaries, and priorities. Remember what I said? It's about deciding what not to do. This is where that really comes in because the mistake people make, and I've seen it, they grow too fast because they want to keep responding to the demand, but they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have bandwidth, if you will. Um, it's not sustainable. So limitations, boundaries, and priorities are saying, you know, all things considered, our primary focus is going to be, so let's go back to that counseling center. We're gonna we're gonna focus more on court systems. Yeah, it's you know other other people might need us, but our priority moving forward is going to be serving those people who are referred by the court system. What that means is we don't need to go out and drum up a lot more business because we have set that limitation. Again, we're adapting so that we can find something that's sustainable. Um, boundaries, things things that you're not going to do. We you know we will. We will work with adults from the court system, but because we can't serve everybody, maybe even within that group, we, we can't work with um, psychosis and we can't work with sexual deviancy, right? So you, you start to set boundaries. And, and again, you can start to see the, the more you start to shave off, the more that, that core and that potential for deeper impact happens. So th that's what growth is. You get this model. Let's see what happens. We, we're, we're successful. Now we have to find a way that we can say we can keep this up. And I can tell you this growing too fast, where it shows first is you wear out the very people you depend on. People can only pedal so fast. And if your growth is based on people working harder, um, that's not sustainable. So that, again, that's all part of that growth orientation. Okay, so then how do you know when you're moving toward maturity? Well, that's when you have found a way, you, you set your priorities, you've, you've set your limitations, you've set your boundaries, you're going five, six years, seems to be working, you're generating a little bit of operating reserve so you're not living hand to mouth. You're starting to get good relationships, you've got, you're sort of recognized in your domain for for what you do um then so th th that that's great and again the tricky part there is you you can't sit still because again remember that wind that blows it blows on mature organizations too so this idea of affirmation is to say well given that this is changing so let me let me give you a good example and i and i, I will this will be a personal example i was on the crossroad board here in fort wayne for about 10 years and I was there when a dramatic shift occurred. And that's when the state was moving from residentially based to home and community based. 
Crossroads entire business model was built on a residential census, right? The government, the county government or whoever DCS sends money and says, house these three people and do everything for them. Great. When they when that happened, it was it was a shock because you could just see everything from census to finances just really heading down. And so we, we went through this process. In fact, that's where this this model, this conceptual model originated was me working with them on that board for 10 years. Um, we if we kept up what we were doing, we would go out of business. So what we had to do was to affirm, we've been around for over 140 years, right? So what we did was the strategic focus, we went back and we clarified the organizational core. And what we discovered by looking backward, remember that part? We were founded as an orphanage. Churches in Ohio and Michigan and Indiana would send orphans to Crossroad to work on the farm and would also send the money to take care of them, right? That worked for a while. We then became um, a home for unwed mothers, which then developed into an adoption. So, you know, of course you shunned unmarried pregnant women, you sent them off. Um, and, and so that's what Crossroad did. From there, they became, you know, this idea of troubled youth, the ragamuffins in town, they would be sent there. And they would help, again, they would teach them work ethic, working on the farm. Then in the 70s, they became part of the state's child welfare system, which is when the money from DCS and others, Medicaid, all those places, came in and said, please take care of these kids. That's what was changing. So we look back and said, what, what's been constant? And what we, what we really realized was we've always focused on the most difficult to serve kids. What those circumstances were over time changed, but it's always been the most difficult. So now for kids to come to Crossroad, they have to have had two psych hospitalizations in a year, um, heavy duty kids that no one else can deal with. That's their wheelhouse. So out of that, understanding that core, we then said, well, this, this opens up all kinds of things. Because maybe now, if we're not going to be a residential facility, we still have those same kids with needs. So we got the school and became a, an independent school where so kids from anybody, anywhere could come. We, we, it, we expanded beds for the most difficult psych kids we responded and stayed relevant. We look very different, but we're exactly where we were from our organizational core. So even though we had market shifts and industry changes, we affirmed who we were and said, and, and the phrase that we came up with was we're not what we used to be, but still who we've always been. Um, so that's an example of, of a mature organization that had to do some really uh, deep strategic thinking, even though they've been around for 140 years. The last one, and my hope is you never find yourself here, and that is you have to reinvent the organization. You have to reposition yourselves. Um, I, I will describe it this way. This happens, and I think I used this phrase earlier, the world just passes you by. You you became insulated, and all the discussions were internal. Um, you you became you became irrelevant. Um, that's not fun. I've been involved in a couple of those kinds of discussions as well. The challenge to this is, oftentimes it takes a financial crisis for your board to say. This isn't good. I, and I will not name the name. I am working currently with an organization that is on this decline slope. Um, they have declining, they're fee-based, cli declining clientele. Um, they've been chipping away at their operating reserve. 
that they now have about three months left. Their financial slide has been going on for about 10 years. Only now is the board saying, oh, we, we better do something. Honestly, it might be too little too late. So what they're, what they're going to have to do, when again, they had all these disruptors, erosion of the client base, decrease in net assets, growing competition. So one of the challenges is if the world passes you by, this isn't a marketing problem. They say, oh, we need, to, we need to then publicize what we do. Well, guess what? There are now five other places doing exactly what you do um, and maybe even better than what you do. This is a very difficult place to be in, but your, your, your overall goal is you've got to renew the relevance. I don't, I'm not saying you go back and you, re, and you rewrite your mission. It's working from that mission. Your strategy may need to change. You may need to find a new lane. You're still in the pool. You're not jumping to a different pool. Again, the challenge is by now, a lot of those lanes are filled. So this is very difficult to do. This sometimes will end in an acquisition or a merger. Sometimes it ends and the nonprofit goes out of business. Um, but again, it, it's, it's a matter of becoming complacent. You, you, know, you sort of sit at the top of that circle or that bell curve. And, and it's sort of you're, you're gradually sliding until one day you look up and say, oh my gosh, how did we get from there to here? Gradually. <laughs> but that, that's what this turnaround is about, is, is kind of reestablishing um, that relevance. What I'd like to do then, if I could, is to, is to stop sharing and then see your faces and have a little bit of a discussion. Hello, everybody. <laughs> there you are. Um, how many of you had difficulty filling out that organizational core section of that worksheet? Hey, Mike, we yes. um, did not send that sheet out. We were going to send it after, but oh, okay. I think okay. Sarah put a it put it in the in the chat. So okay. there's a link in the chat for everybody to pull that up. Okay. Well, then in general, that, that question about who needs you most and what do they need most from you, is that on the tip of your tongue? By show of hand, how many found that that was relatively easy for you to do? You, you could rattle it off. You raise your hand. Zach, can I ask you to share yours? Sure. Um, so um, the nonprofit I'm representing today is um, Camp Whitley. We're a, a summer overnight stay camp. Um, and, you know, I think that our main focus we've really honed in on, it's, it's how are we able to provide this experience for kids, you know, seven to 14 throughout the summer to, you know, have an outlet to burn some energy, unplug for a week, um, you know, make some friends and connections um, at a kind of pivotal time in their life. So, okay. So, so what, tell me about those kids. Is it anybody seven to 14? Um, so uh, it is um, uh, kids age seven to 14, there is a fee to sign up for the camp. It's a week long stay away camp. Um, and we split the kids up in groups of seven, eight, nine, uh, 10, 11, 12, and then 13, 14. And we okay. have separate weeks for boys and girls. So okay. six weeks total. And wh where do these kids come from? And why are they the ones that come? Um, we get a lot from the uh, surrounding community um, in Whitley County. So we've been around for 95 years. Um, so we have great, um, I guess, recognition in our okay. community. Um, and we get a lot of, you know, generational interest. Okay. So you really don't differentiate. You don't really care who those kids are. It's, it's the camp experience that's more universal. 
That's absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and the important part of that is you identify it and you're very clear on it. We're, we're not, because you could say, well, if we had to make some decisions, are there some groups of kids that could benefit more than others? But you're saying for now, we don't have to ask that question. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly right. Okay. Did anybody have difficulty or would have difficulty answering those questions? Even the first two, who needs you most and what do they need most from you? I ask that because you're you're in you're surrounded by friendly colleagues here who can help you think through it. Hi, Mike. This is Tammy. Hi, Tammy. I, I thought those were the easiest two questions to ah, answer. Okay. Tell tell me why. Um, because that's what we live and do every day. I mean, we we have a focus on the clients that we want to serve and what we can provide, and so we've made a, an effort not to duplicate any services um, and to keep our focus always at the forefront so because it's pretty easy to be um not want to say pressured but well can't you just take the, care of this patient too or can't right. we just do this so you have to really keep that at the forefront so you don't get distracted okay and can you tell us what those answers to those two questions are i gotta look at the sheet again oh, yeah who who needs you most and what do they need most oh. from you um, so who needs us most are uninsured residents of the four Northeast counties. Okay. And right. what they need from us is health care. Okay. Are, are there any, any limitations to what kind of health care you can provide? Um, hmm. Anything you won't or can't do? Yeah. OB and maternity. Okay. Yeah. Those are two things. Childhood vaccinations. Okay. Um, I think those are the th top ones that come to mind. Yeah, so so you're already saying this is what we're not or can't do, which is again is as important as you know, identifying that that core group because right. you could say, well, well, if it's healthcare for everyone in the four counties who's uninsured, that could blow up in a lot of different directions, <laughs> which is which is okay if, if you want to, <laughs> right? And you yeah. can, and you can handle it. Yeah, I I think you have to be really careful not to let it blow up though, because then you really get um spread pretty thin and then you yep. lose focus of what your main purpose was in the beginning your mission yeah and, and that's a difficult part i get this um do we serve fewer people and serve them better or are we making a better contribution by serving more people at a little bit more shallow level i don't know the answer to that you probably all have your own angie i saw your head can i can i pick on you a little bit there yeah we're in a, a new and Mike, we haven't talked about this for as a little background. Mike has worked with us about three or four times now. I'm losing count, Mike, to help us continue to grow from the time we restructured until now. And we are in a growth phase right now, going through some of this adaptation because we realize that, you know, we know who we serve. We serve people who are in a financial crunch. For whatever okay. reason that might be. They're in a financial crunch. So the you don't care why. Is, yeah. Question. Well, we do in a sense, because okay. we, um, this is what led to our growth. We wanted to find out and really hone in. What are those things that are causing that crunch? What are the, the top three to five things that are putting people through our door? And we spent a lot of time mm -hmm. last year doing that. And we landed on five of them. And there are five things that our community is currently addressing as well. So that's lining up nicely. Nice. But this year, 2023, is about sustainability. So we can't do all of those things that are massive projects. We know we can't do all of them to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. So we're in this phase right now of looking at which, which ones, what are the resources they take? Some of them don't take very many resources. Some of them will not change a personnel resource at all, but they might change a financial perspective a little bit. Um, for instance, we're working on a whole new, building a whole new ministry, and Jenna's involved in this too, she's somewhere in here, I saw her on there, um, to address people who have a car repair and they're choosing between that car repair and a home, you know, paying their rent and utilities. We can't change all of transportation, but mm -hmm. like you taught us, what can we do? And we're approaching that and we took training to design a whole new ministry that doesn't take much we had a meeting yesterday it doesn't take much personnel 
at all. It doesn't really change our application process. We have a different application for it, but it's still the same policy process. New policies have to be around that particular ministry, which are going to be a little bit different than we've dealt with before because we're putting the organization at a little bit more risk with the way that we're going to come behind that with some financial input. Yeah. But we also were given, uh, we we're faith-based and we believe God affirms or uh, he lets us know when we're on the right track. That ministry is 100% funded for what our target was to even think about starting it. And it's funded plus a little bit. Hmm. So we, we're working through each one of these pieces. What's the personnel does it take? What's the financial parts it takes? Are there things that, um, you know, are there things that are going to stress us too much that we need to find other community partners to come around and help us with, it, you know, people that are doing like-minded things. So we're kind of in that, that identifying the limitations, the boundaries, the priorities, the, mm -hmm. we know these are all major issues that need to be addressed, but are we the one, we can't do all of it. So which ones are impacting our people that we do see the most and what can we do about those? Yeah, and, and that's a great example. The, the difficult part of strategy, it's not like there is a right answer and we have to find it. It's about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And and I, I am more concerned, not what you decide, but the process that you use to decide. And as long as your board is is thinking from a strategic perspective, they understand the rationale for what they're doing. In other words, do it on purpose. Mm -hmm. Don't don't by default or sort of back into something. And and so it's all about the discussions. And and again, what comes of it is is whatever's right for you. What about others? Any other questions or comments about this whole organizational core piece? What about um, this life cycle? Do you, do you have a sense, at least based on this diagram, this chart of where you are as an organization strategically? Again, you could be really well established organizationally. In other words, you could have a great facility, uh, you know, you've got enough money to do what you need to do, but maybe floundering, you're just, you know, that in the wind and maybe you're, you're you know, you've got a couple of the bolts on the ground loose, so you're starting to hike up a little bit when the wind blows. Do, do you know where you stand in terms of, of your strategy phase? Mike, I think, I guess I, I, it's a comment, but maybe a question for input. We know where we stand on our strategy phase through our strategic playbook for the organization as a whole. But now there are these little pockets of strategy as we develop these new initiatives that we have sort of strategies within that greater strategy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. making sure we approach the strategies for these this new program, like let's say getting started, which is the transportation program. So approaching the strategy for that while maintaining the strategy for the greater organization. Yeah, Any and, input is welcome. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're sort of right. They're sort of macro and, and micro. And and my guess is even the micro stuff flowed out of the that macro vision of what we're what we can do, what we can't do. And then the same thought process, who are we serving in this program? So it's kind of a more of a universal statement here, but much more specific, which again, that's it's it is the same, it's the same thought process. Is just know what your own logic is. It's really, you know, most most of the work that I do in strategy um, is is gaining clarity. Um, that if if you have a clear sense of what you're doing. Um, what you should do next is even, it's, it's not as difficult to understand. So it's, it's sort of pushing people to be really clear on when you say, for example, I asked Zach about the, well, which, which kids? And th that's, that's the discussion you want. That's strategic level discussion, even though that was kind of an offhand comment, it, it comes from the same place. Are we really clear? on who that population is. Again, if you're not, it's obvious. 
you're going to be pulled. You need a reason to say no. What's what's the song? There's a million reasons to <laughs> to say yes, but you know, give me one reason to say no to flip that song. You know? And and that's really what it is. Is on what basis would we ever say no? And organizations that never say no. Uh, again, that, good luck as this marathon continues. You just ran a 5K. Uh, this is a marathon. Any other comments or questions or anything related? Anything that I didn't talk about that you have questions about? Just to make sure everyone was able to uh, access that worksheet through the chat, correct? Just by nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Careful when you nod, get picked on. Well, Sarah, I, I will turn it over to you then if there are no more questions or comments. Uh, absolutely. Um, like we said, we we wanted to allow a little bit more time when we did the the hour with our sessions last year. It never seemed like enough time. So we were hoping for this great question and answer time. Um, please know that Mike is available after um, these this presentation. You have his contact information that if you feel more comfortable emailing a question, he's happy to provide resources that way, as well as Tom, Margarita, and Julie and I. So please be, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. Um, just a reminder that that survey and a recording of this presentation will be coming to you through email. Um, apologize for some bumpy starts with power outages and things this morning and just a little bit of complications getting going on the front end, but we're really excited to have you all be joining with us for the 2023 season um, and excited for all of the learning that's gonna take place. So know that you can never bother us too much if there's a burning question on your mind in an area of your organization that you need help and support in. We, we would love to hear from you and, and help you with, with resources.